Tales from my D&D campaign. The party has just reached the rendezvous point for their simple FedEx mission. The trade has been prearranged. All they have to do is give this chest to Bob the Kuatoa, who will give them the second of three magic artifact spoons, which Don de Corsair wants them to sell to embattled Vistria, saving thousands of starving refugees, and making themselves a buttload of money. Unfortunately, what they actually found when they reached the landmark was this massive humanoid fish monster who looked like some kind of half Kuatoa, half ogre hybrid, and that's when everything goes to hell. Actually, it's not, I jumped the gun a little. But as he disengages his alchemical invisibility cloak, he's like, You are not the dwarf we deal with. This is some kind of trick. Who sent you? And they're all like, Don de Corso sent us because his friend couldn't make it and he didn't want to keep you waiting. But they know a dick when they see one. And the more aggressive fish ogre guy gets, the closer they are to just saying, We don't have to take this. Eat sword, flail, chain, and crossbow. Fortunately, before things get totally out of hand, a second KT appears a ways behind Fish Ogre Guy, and this one looks like a totally normal Kuatoa, only with fancy clothes and no armor. And he's like, Patience, Volbo. I know for a fact they're d on hate such delays and disruptions as much as I do. Therefore, as long as the goods are here, I will accept their explanation. So they hand the chest over to Volbo, the fish ogre bodyguard, and once he's checked it for traps, he passes it back to Baob, who pulls out the rod. And Baob looks at it for a sec, then he holds it to his palm and fires off the electric blast. The electricity zaps out and crackles, and you can smell the ozone, and, like, nothing happens. Like, this pudgy fish man does not even flinch. Nothing. But he seems happy with it anyway, and Bob smiles and explains how it is a good trade, and how De Corso and eventually Vistria get this magic spoon that can feed thousands of people a day, which the Elude don't really need because they have a powerful economy and tons of farming. And on his side, Bob and the Elude get another of these rods, which are kind of sad on land, like you can knock out two average humans, or less if they're heroes, but underwater it's a whole different story. The zap is a little bit weaker there, but it spreads out to a electrify like a 30-foot radius, and even at 2d6 is still enough damage to incapacitate most of the slaves who form the bulk of Kuatoa armies on both sides of the undersea war. Of course, Bob notes smugly, it does not harm the Kua. And while the party is processing this, Bob reaches over his shoulder and pulls a pearl white spoon out of thin air, almost like it was handed to him by somebody invisible, which reminds them that virtually every Kuatoa you meet on land is equipped with one of their alchemical invisibility cloaks, and that in turn reminds them that this friendly unarmed Bob guy and his fish ogre bodyguard are almost certainly not alone out here. But he's like, please remind your dad that if he reconsiders selling me the recipe for these rods, I would pay quite handsomely for it. And he gently tosses the spoon to Angel and tells them the command word, and they test it, and it seems to work. And that's when everything goes to hell. Suddenly, Bob flinches, not from the stun rod, but from a weird green glow that hits him. It doesn't seem to kill him or poison him or mind control him or do anything really except startle him and make him glow bright green, which Black and Raven recognize as a harmless fairy fire spell, except that making you glow bright green is pretty much an act of war against guys who are used to being able to turn invisible at the first sign of trouble. And as a motley bunch of humans, plus a couple elves and a handful of halflings, run up over a ridge, one of them calls out, We've got you this time, you damn trouts! And the rest of them agree with a chorus of similar threat-insult combos, firing crossbows while chanting, FOR THE WAR BOND! And the players are all like, what the hell is the war bond? But Little One knows about these guys because he grew up in an area called the Peace Bond, probably the only person in a hundred years who grew up in the Peace Bond. The Peace Bond was a treaty signed 160 years ago between Laric, the halfling nation, and the evil Diluvian Empire, where Laric basically said, what can we give you to not kill us, and pretty much gave it to them. This included their entire coastline and the 50 kilometer strip inland, a buffer zone which has also become known as the Peace Bond. Only now, many of the descendants of the people relocated by the treaty are demanding their forefathers' lands back. A whole bunch of independent, unaffiliated groups of protesters and or vandals and or terrorists have arisen, each calling their movement the War Bond. And the whole rest of their country is terrified they'll somehow succeed in being noticed, inciting the Diluvians to get off their evil asses and conquer Laric. But back in the present, the Warbond Freedom Terrorists attack Baob and his fish ogre bodyguard, and they have an elf druid who casts Entangle, and you can see where some invisible guards were caught by the grasping roots and junk. And the players are like, should we do anything? 
because they kind of feel like they should, but they all hate Kuatoa for various personal reasons, and most of them kind of sympathize with these warbond freedom terrorists. So the warbond goons rain down poorly aimed crossbow bolts, and the fish ogre Volbo is like, It's an ambush! We've been betrayed! And Black's like, Wait, they think we betrayed them? But that's kind of what it looked like, due to the convenient timing and the fact that the warbond freedom terrorists were not attacking the party. But Bob is like, It is the Diluvians who took your coast, and the only thing that has prevented them from making war on you, and dwellers, is my people, the Illud, who battle them in the seas over the Leviathan. But the warbond leader, Jimmy, shouts back, Lies! We've been tracking you for over a month now, all the way from the peace bond. You're slippery bastards, I'll give you that. But you couldn't shake us, and now that we've caught you, you won't get away. Then Bob's like, The peace bond? We've been camped here more than a week because our trade contact was delayed. You've been tracking your own imagination. And that part makes sense, because... But Ob didn't know DeCorso's people would be several days late, so he must have been here all that time waiting. But then Little One is like, Oh, there's another group of Kuatoa. And once he says it, everyone else puts it together. Like, these Warbond guys must have been following another group, probably Diluvians since they started from the Peace Bond, and they've trekked halfway across the continent trying to follow them only to run into Bob's group instead. And there might still be Diluvians lurking around, or maybe Jimmy's just a big huge idiot and the group he was following is long gone, but they're still like, so should we do anything? Like, they have the spoon. Technically, they could just leave. But Black interposes himself between the two sides, because he's a priest of protection. And they're like, are we fighting the war bond now? And Black's like, I don't like the idea of hurting or killing humans to protect a Kuatoa. I... Don't know. But they get drawn into fighting the Warbond guys and their druid's wolf companions, and Draven casts C and Viz, and Angel hears or spots a movement in the woods and disappears after it, because her player was absent for a session, while Black and Little One take minus four to hit to deal non-lethal damage with their attacks. And Bob sees this, and since his side hasn't really been hurt yet, he calls out orders in the KT language, and his guys start aiming to incapacitate instead of killing two. But as all this has been going on, Little One's been thinking about the big picture, and now he's decided that we can't let Bob take that rod back to Illu. If it's so effective at knocking out slaves, and both sides use slave armies for most of their underwater fighting, they could reverse engineer the rod and mass produce them and destabilize the war. He even said he wanted to buy the blueprints from DeCorso. And Draven's like, I agree that our interests are better served by the stalemate than by letting either side, even Elude, win. But if he wants the blueprint so bad, maybe they can't reverse engineer it. And Black's like, I'm against killing Bob at this point. And Draven's like, yeah, that too. But Little One's like, oh, I'm not going to kill Bob, but I'm sticking close to him. And if he happens to die, I'm taking back the rod. And what if he doesn't die? I don't want them to get that rod. And then... Bob looks over the ridge where these Warbond guys came from, and he's like, Of course. Now you reveal yourselves. Then he looks at the Warbonders, and he's like, You idiots. It's an ambush. What? Fine. You idiots. It's a trap. And there's a ghastly crackling of electrical discharges, a whole bunch of small metal spheres electrocute all the Warbond crossbowmen, leaving only the Druidbarians, one real Druid, a skilled halfling sniper, and their leader, Jimmy. And because doing damage virtually always breaks invisibility in D&D, &D, a whole line of Kuatoa decloak along the ridge with that familiar tearing sound. And unlike Bob's men, these guys all wear the black cloaks and the gaping maw shields of the Diluvian Empire. And little ones like, yep, I knew it. And that's when the battle gets serious. Next time on Tales from My D&D Campaign. If you have any questions, comments, or criticism, you can post it on the forums, or make a comment below, and hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode of Tales from My D&D Campaign. It's a trap.